and welcome to the Nick and Niche Cast. It's the Diggity Doodah, Dr. Peptide Panther, Mr. Slippers here with the Wobbly Wildcard, and we are going to talk through the Black Caps' first test loss to Australia. It was fairly mediocre, um, but nothing new coming up against those Aussies. So we're going to dive deep into that first test. We've got a bit of news regarding the Black Caps squad as well. Um, with Kyle Jamison coming in th into the squad to replace a Lockie Ferguson. So that might get a little bit of discussion. Tambien, Mr. Wobbly Wildcard, how go thee? Yeah, not too bad, Doc, not too bad. I saw um, John Frusciante rejoin the Red Hot Chili Peppers, so it's always nice to have a little more Frusciante in a person's life. Definitely, definitely did see that as well, or... How, how much are you tuning into the Red Hot Chili Peppers in 2019, in as far as That's like, a new fair question. goes? Zero um, percent would be the answer. I don't particularly have any interest in anything. Like, I mean, to be honest, they've, um, they're not going to come up with another masterpiece at this point, are they? And like at this point in time, at this stage in their career, but like they also do sell out stadiums across the world. So like... You know, I'm just I'm just happy for old Mr. Frusciante because he was with that band through all of their best periods, I believe, uh, in my humble opinion. I think all their best work was done when that dude was in the band. And there's a video I saw of him once from, like, it's on YouTube. It was like a German TV interview after he'd left them in, like, the early 90s the first time. And he was so strung out on heroin at that point. He looked like an actual ghost. Like, his eyes were sunk so deep in his face, he wouldn't know they were there. And... He was so, like, uh, you know, frisky and choppy in the, in the way he was talking in that interview. And, like, to think 25 years later or whatever, that dude is even just still alive. It's kind of like a cosmic miracle. But I'm happy for the fella that he's going to make a lot of money playing in a band that makes a lot of money. So, fair play. Frusciante's coming back for his third stint as a yeah, what do you um, reckon? Red, Hot, Red Hot Chili Peppers member, which is interesting. He offers like a, if we talk if we're we're doing a sports podcast so it'll be rude not to put this in like a sporting context he offers like a unique skill set to the red hot chili peppers so you'd imagine that him coming back will primarily like he's a, he's not just going to come back to tour songs like you would bring him back at this stage to perhaps rejuvenate some new material like you're not going to bring john frusciante back just to play old songs kind of thing are you no well the rumor is that they're back in the studio working on something new which sort of like easy to brush off just like i was saying before i don't think they're going to come up with anything special that's like must hear um the dude they they kicked out the guy who replaced him who'd been in the band for like eight or nine years or whatever and they just kicked him out to bring back <laughs> to bring back their old mates so um clearly like uh, I don't know, clearly a, a mutual decision on all fronts there. I think the dude, the uh, Klinghoffer his name was, who who replaced him, was pretty much just like trying to play Frusciante's licks and just trying to be him, like imitating him. So um, if you can get the real deal, you might as well. It's a bit like bringing Trent Belt back into the, into the Black Cats bowling attack, I guess. It definitely is, and that might help the Black Caps because I don't know how you assess that test match but i thought the bowling performance from the black caps was pretty damn impressive considering uh lockie ferguson only bowled 11 overs and then the black caps were left to somehow try and bowl australia out twice without a full strength bowling attack which australia did to new zealand but when we flipped the the, the scenario around for a black caps team in australia against a very good australian team in australia you kind of want your full artillery and they didn't have their full artillery going into the test without trent bolton and to lose a bowler on the fly was also a bit tricky so i'm i found the bowling performance pretty impressive and uh they, let's just say they went into their full bag of tricks like they were forced to go into all their plans and they did that and they took a lot of wickets, which is nice. The batting performance, though, um, while there were plenty of moments of great skill, great determination, things we've come to expect from the Black Caps, the vibe from that, the batting performances was the same thing we've seen basically throughout my whole life watching cricket, where Australian bully the Kiwi batsman. It wasn't just like um, 
with the cricketing skills per se, but when you're watching the Black Caps bat, everything about that little vision that you're seeing and what you're hearing just looks like they are being bullied. And that was nothing new. We've seen it throughout um, our time following cricket. And that's where the, the most improvement needs to be made, uh, in my opinion, is just coming out and asserting themselves on the situation and trying to get into the test and do what they do best as opposed to being dictated to by the Australians. Which is pretty much what happened. And like that's the... That, like I've got I can go both ways on this is the thing like I've got a I've got like the angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other shoulder talking to me about this test match and I I mean I, I don't have to choose which way to go because both of these things are true is kind of the thing about it. I agree the bowling is, I thought the bowling was um Southie and Wagner in particular were fantastic I think um they, they each got four for 90 odd in the first innings and second innings Southie five for sixty nine and Wagner three for fifty eight for three fifty nine. So, guts to Neil Wagner who didn't get to keep up his streak of taking a five for, and I think it was four previous um, test matches he didn't get a five for this time, so he could have had five for five fivers. But you're close enough, you know. He's still got eight wickets for the match. Bowled outstandingly well. Southie bowled fantastically well, which is good for people to see Tim Southie dominating against a good team as well dominating is a funny word but you know bowling to his capacity against a good team because you know he he cops it very unfairly because his ODI stats might not be anywhere near uh, good enough over the last few years but his test stuff has been fantastic he's like his average has been sinking down for a long time now this isn't a one or two year resurgence this is like a you know the last five or six years he's been a very 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 good test bowler so that was great. Um, DeGronome chipped in nicely as well. Cheat Revival got a wicket. I think there's, we might have, we, I mean, we might not have to because we've done this conversation before, but I think Mitch Santner basically showed more of what Mitch, Mitch Santner does, which is um, comfortable economic bowling with almost zero threat of taking wickets, which was a bit of an issue on that, you know, in that situation. Um, part of what, that's part of why I go both ways on this test match, though, is that Australia basically won this thing in the first two days the you know batting for a day and a half putting up a big score and then at the very end of the um the very end of that day coming into bowl under lights with a new ball bowlers completely rested and fired up and just got a bunch of quick wickets and had us was it like uh it was, it was five down by the end of um by the end of that day wasn't it and the that just like r kind of ripped the heart out of the black caps for the rest of the test match there just wasn't much overcoming that you just you, you, ca you can't overcome that you just got to not put yourself in that situation in the first place but compare the two situations that australia had to bat in and new zealand had to bat in and it's like apples and oranges which is part of the problem of um it's not a problem but it's just part of the adjustment period to to having these day night test matches which is that australia just had such better conditions whereas australia got to bat australia basically got to bat on the perfect batting conditions when the pitch was still nice and flat and comfortable they put up 400 odd we came in and batted under lights and brutal conditions against like quick bowlers moving the ball around a bit and bowling super intimidatingly and like we kind of crumbled but i think most teams would crumble and i think if you flip the scripts there if we got to bat first on that one and then got to bowl in that. I don't think we have, well, I mean, I know we don't have the the same level of firepower that the Australian pace attack has in terms of just ripping through a team that quickly like that. We tend to uh, work for our wickets a little bit more. But it would have changed the game. Like, if we would batted first, different story. And that's why I that's why I have a few excuses for the Black Caps in this, because um, especially when you add in uh, losing Lockie Ferguson, losing um, Trent Bolt beforehand, like, it just wasn't, you know, there are a lot of not quite mitigating factors because you still got to do the best in the situation you're in. But, like, there are a lot of reasons why this wasn't necessarily a representative performance of what the Black Caps can offer for the rest of this tour. Yeah, and all of that's fine, but the the, the vibe was still the same. Like, I, I wrote about that and I outlined all those mitigating factors, but the 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 takeaway was that nothing has changed in the balance of uh, 
like cricket between Australia and New Zealand. The Australians still behave like the Australians and the Kiwis still behave like the Kiwis. And I guess the reason I'm leaning into that observation about the vibe and the energy and just, just stuff that can't be measured is because I think it was the biggest determining factor. Like it was still a case of the Aussies in every aspect, regardless of those mitigating factors, the Aussies dictated what they wanted to do and did so with a typical Australian energy to that. And whether it was how they chirped behind the stumps there, um, like even the way Matt Wade was dealing with the short ball from Neil Wagner, like that's <laughs> what you would expect from an Aussie. The the antics under the under the helmet, like I'm far less concerned about um, the details of the test per se because the bowlers took a lot, a lot of wickets, uh, the black caps performed pretty well considering the circumstance. What is most telling to me is the behavior of the two teams. And it was also interesting, like there was a lot of interaction between the two teams. Like there was um, before play, you saw black caps standing there talking to the Australian players. Like there was not chirping or sledging but there were just conversations between players from either teams on the field and it was that we expect that from kiwis and australians as well but in terms of how the cricket test was um played out it was just normal australia against normal new zealand and that's just like that's a that factors in our long cricketing history but it's also just in that isolation of that first test so now i'm I also have a, a knowledge of what the Black Caps do very well, and that is learn from test to test. So now that first test played out how a lot of tests between New Zealand and Australia has played out, not in terms of performances and necessarily results, but in the terms of the Australians being Australians on the cricket field and Kiwis being the little brother who can't quite hang with the Aussies. That was the first test. Now I'm just interested in how and what adjustments they do make and what um, kind of mentality and energy they bring to the second test, which could be even trickier for the Black Caps. Like there's not a whole lot of action apparently on that MCG, MCG pitch and we don't have X-Factor bowlers. So things could be even more difficult on a less invigorating pitch because you only like it only felt like i had prior to this test i said that this day night test is the perfect start for the black caps because the black caps have swing bowlers and the ball's going to hoop around a whole lot so this is their best chance to um make hay and I, if things get flatter or just not quite as exciting it just keeps falling in favor of australia and i don't think the black caps have the artillery, the the X factor, to um, outplay Australia on a pitch that, on a pitch in, in general conditions that don't offer as much as what we saw in Perth, primarily as the uh, day's play went under lights. Because you mentioned Australia enjoying the better of conditions, like I loved it because most of the time like when the black caps were bowling there was always a, always a chance that when it moved into the evening session the black caps could take wickets so it was like i enjoyed that element and i enjoy of that element playing into the skill set of the black caps but that's going to change uh for boxing day yeah it is um it's it's tricky to think because I mean, I their bowling attack is going to be better full stop just by having Trent Bolt in there, and by all accounts, it sounds like Trent Bolt should recover in time to be able to play to so his pretty much his full capacity, which really they need him. We saw in this Test match, they need him. They need that extra guy. They need that you know crafty left hander, one of the best bowlers in the world. We need something like that just to be that extra weapon. So, but like at the same time. You will never win a test match against Australia scoring under a hun under 200 in back-to-back -back innings, and the conditions will be a little bit better for batting. It sounds like, but what we saw from some of the batsmen in this test match was that they can be gotten out regardless of like independent of the conditions. There's just I guess it's that intimidation you're talking about, where like Jeet Raval's obviously struggling big time. Um, 
Henry Nichols didn't really have a great test match there. Like even just Neil Wagner getting out first ball as a night watchman is just a little. I mean, it's again that was under lights, but still like just little mistakes you can't allow. Because I mean, even if that had if he'd just stuck in around to the end of the play then you're coming back out the next day and you can maybe have that frustrating half an hour or so where Aussie are getting a bit annoyed because they can't get the night watchman out all the while as that's happening Ross Taylor's allowed to play himself in for the in the morning what well, in the whatever you call it the afternoon session whatever you, the first session of the play the next day and maybe he's able to build on towards a nice hundred if that's the case but it wasn't and we crumbled and we fell apart a little bit and like just a lot of those little factors where we couldn't quite I guess it's not quite being able to hang with Big Brother again but I'm not really sure what the what the flip side of that is because the Black Caps have got to where they are playing a certain way and they have a you know a, a mentality of doing things and they're not going to change anything to face Australia so it's and Australia when they're on top are always going to be chirping you know that's what they do they're not going to shut up and they're probably going to be like that if they're, you know, if it's a close game or if maybe if they're losing as well. But like, I'm not like, I mean, we don't have, we don't want to start playing like Australia in order to beat Australia because that's just dumb. If you take on them at their own game, well, they're the masters of their own game. It's just going to make things even worse. But I don't know. I guess it's just a matter of guys learning the lessons of this one and adapting, which. Yeah, I mean, you're right. That's something this team is very good at. It's something that served them extremely well at the World Cup was being able to um, assess conditions very quickly, move on from one game to the next, make small little adjustments. It's something that's been a factor of why they've been such a good test team over the last year or two. And I guess we're going to see the ultimate um, uh, precious situation of that, aren't we? Because this Boxing Day test, I mean, the series is on the line now. If they lose it. They, they can't come back and claim things. I mean, the way the test championship works is that you get points for individual games, so at least there will be something uh, significant on the line regardless of what happens. But yeah, if you want to go well in the test championship, it would help to be able to get a draw or a win across uh, one, if not both, of these last two games. And that's how you got to do it, I suppose. I mean, is there anything else that's going to set them apart other than guys just, like, being a little bit better and not making crucial mistakes at crucial times no like they just got to be play better cricket that's the pretty much where where it sits you you alluded to the the black caps playing like aussies but that's not at all the situation because the black caps just need to do a far better job of being the black caps yeah exactly um we've talked about this you know with skills so like if you go here, you got to bring this skill set. If you go there, you got to bring this skill set instead of maybe leaning towards what you do best. And when I say that the the Aussies lived up to their bullying nature, that's not to say that the Black Caps need to counter that with what the Australians do. The the Black Caps they just got to be a whole lot more just solid in in who they are and what they do because. It's one thing to be nice and hardworking and um, skillful and crafty little Kiwis, but if you're not doing that with a, any ounce or slither of solid foundations that are deeply rooted in, in confidence and assertiveness, that's not going to work out. And like, I think that's what Neil Wagner offers. Neil Wagner offers the the... Um, stuff on top but he's got that solid foundation of when the shit hits the fan i'm gonna i'm gonna step up and i'm gonna go even harder and i'm gonna really bring this fight to the australians and i and that wasn't quite reflected in the whole team and more just as a collective um as opposed to individuals like the collective vibe from the black caps or again this is very hard to describe but it just looked like they weren't completely willing to um just fight for something in this test when shit got difficult what tended to happen was they would go into their shells and then if you go into your shell against australia they're just going to roll all over you and standing up instead of standing up strong and and digging in kind of thing yeah it was a 
tricky pitch because of the way it was moving around as well like just the cracks that were opening up you you saw in that second innings with the black caps so it didn't have really a lot to bat for i mean we weren't going to chase 468 and chances where we weren't going to last the best part of two days on that thing either so it was really just a matter of extending things out but you did see a few guys who like got in for a while and um you know i can i'm looking at the thing at what four different five different guys faced at least 40 deliveries but then everyone just you know got out no one passed 50 it was like yeah so well just on the starts like it's it's all well to get a start but what do you the i guess the the root of this discussion is like can you go to the next level once you got your start because that's where the those strong foundations and your assertiveness and your um, confidence in yourself like all those players showed the the peripheral um, graft and skill and and grit to endure that opening spell but none of them had anything to offer going deeper so for me that is a nice example of what I'm talking about because they didn't have the ability to assert themselves even further and take Australia that little bit further to see if the Aussies would break, to see how the Aussies would respond to um, a little bit of a counter-attack. Instead, they did some of the hard work, but the most important stages of their innings, which were the middle phases, getting from 20 to 50 and then 50 to 100, that's where they went missing. For sure, and that's something that Australia did extremely well in that first innings, and like just just not losing wickets and clumps, and like um, old mate Labuschagne being able to just hang around there and score runs regardless of situations. I mean, they just, I mean, well, I'll let me have a look at the thing because in the first innings, they were one for forty, two for seventy five, three for two hundred, like, and then etc etc five for 300 like just not succumbing to the pressure as uh, and and that was again like those were the best batting conditions of the of the match but when new zealand came about it we lost early wickets i mean raval scored one in each innings latham got a duck in the first innings he hung around for what 20 odd 18 he got in the in the second innings um by which time he was the fourth wicket to go for 57 like we were just we just couldn't hang with them. We just couldn't stick around. And yeah, it's, the guys were getting out early and guys were getting out after they got little starts. And some of that is just extremely good Australian bowling. Some of that is the pitch they were facing on. And I honestly, like, when BJ Watling got that one, um, I'm sure you would have seen it, when it was like a just maybe just short of a good length, but certainly not short short. And it just ripped up off the pitch and smacked him on the grill, like or on the chin. And like at that point, this is reminiscent of what we saw from that um, from that shield game at the MCG the other week, which got called off. Like, just that's that's pretty bloody dangerous. Like when the ball is hoofing at your head when you don't expect it to be hoofing at your head. And Watling was all right from that, but like batting in on a bit of a minefield like that must have been crazy against the absolute pace like that. And I can't help but feel if it was Australia trying to save a Test match in that situation on a pitch like that, would be hearing a lot more about what like an unacceptable playing conditions those were but because it was new zealand and the result was probably already done by that point like it was just sort of a matter of hanging on there i don't think it got as like i'm not saying it was necessarily worst case scenario there but i think it would have been more of a conversation if that had been the case and that's just another one of those factors i suppose for where the black apps can say well it won't be like that next time even if we didn't deal with it particularly well this time it's another reason to be able to like you know, flush the dunny and move on to the MCG where they, yeah, obviously have had their own problems with the pitch conditions in recent times. But I mean, at least that was ahead of times. And I, I think they're going to, they're not going to take any risks on a boxing day test. You know, that pitch is going to probably be pretty flat for that reason, because they don't want, um, they want to risk what happened in that shield game the other week. But I also, yeah, I, I don't think it's going to be anything crazy. I think it's going to be a lot more predictable because of that, and they're not going to have trouble with sorting it out because it's the MCG ground staff. They know exactly what they're doing, and they're, yeah, <laughs> no risks means um, a lot more of a predictable surface, which is, again, a reason for the Black Caps batsmen to feel like they can at least hang around and don't have to feel the pressure of, um, the lingering pressure of that first test. But, I mean, I guess we're going to have to see it to believe it because... I, I don't want them to drop Raval because, for one thing, he might be our best spinner. And for another thing, like, it's just, 
it's just dumb to make choppy changes all the time to things like that. We can't, you know, they've they don't even have batting cover really. Tom Blundell's going to open the batting. I don't think that's a better option than Jeet Raval. But we just we can't be like two wickets down for one run, two wickets down for twenty against Australia because that's just letting them get their tails up, and that just leads to more and more of that pressure, which we've shown is extremely hard to deal with. So. I guess it just comes back to that same idea, though, is you just got to play better cricket, right? Yeah, and um, you mentioned, like, some of the discussion, and this shit absolutely uh, bores the shit out of me because people are, like, up in arms at, you know, things the Australians do or say in commentary and just, like, that stuff, we don't need to go down that route. But just in terms of, like, what we've seen and heard from that first test, Every, it's just an uh, insight I had, uh, an idea I had just now was like everyone wants to play test cricket in Australia and everyone was very excited to play test cricket in Australia for a New Zealand team. But it also appears that like people don't want what playing test cricket in Australia brings as well. Like we all know what Australians are like. We all know what Australian commentators are like. We all know what Australian cricketers are like. We all know everything about Australia. No one knows anything about us, like anything better about Australia than people from New Zealand. So if we were so desperate to tour Australia, obviously that means we're desperate to experience what the Australians have to give us. You can't you can't want a tour to Australia and then bitch and moan about um, things from touring Australia. It's that is what makes touring Australia such a monumental task, is you've got to deal with so much shit from so many different parties. Like that is the challenge of touring Australia. It's not just a case of playing tough cricket. You also have to deal with all the peripheral bullshit as well. When you come to New Zealand, everyone's going to love you doesn't matter who you are what touring team you are to new zealand everyone's gonna say like oh it's cute to have the sri lankans here we like the sri lankans oh the english are coming here that's nice of them to come here we're gonna find out more about them when you go to australia you're a target especially if you if you're new zealand as well so it just seems like some of the reaction like everyone wants to tour there or everyone wants the black caps to tour there but then people don't want to deal with the shit that touring Australia brings as well. Yeah, I mean, I don't think minefield pitches should be a part of that conversation, but like sledging. I mean, there was that thing about there's that line. Uh, I can't remember who it was. It was probably Cummins or Stark. Um, someone told Jeet Ravel that this was the last innings of his Test career or something like that. If he gets out now, and like people, well, I've I've seen people having a bit of a complaint about that. It's like it's. Trust me, as far as Australian sledges go, Stuart Raval just got off lightly with that line, you know. They probably knew that the stump mics were on at that point and just playing it a little bit safe. Like, that's that's um, that's very low-key as far as those things go. But that's exactly, like, that is, that's what touring Australia means. You don't want them not to sledge. Um, that Kane Williamson article that we're talking about, uh, might have, was that the Patreon one or the one? No, it was the one before that, eh? The, the last cricket one we did. Um, there was that article about Kane Williamson in one of the Aussie papers and there was a quote from Brad Haddon talking about tour and Brad Haddon you know as big a sledger as there ever was talking about um playing at that game in Eden Park at the last World Cup the 2015 World Cup where Kane Williamson had that six down the ground to win it off that Cummins towards the end there and he was saying like they were in town for a couple of days beforehand and everyone was just so nice and everyone was so friendly and it was such a like welcoming atmosphere he said it psyched them out like I mean this goes both ways right they're expecting a battle they're expecting like an arm wrestle we're just gonna like give as good as we get and everything like that and then they come into new zealand who just smile and wave and it's like hold on a second what's going on here <laughs> like it's that that's a that's something i'm not saying it's weaponized but it's something that can have a similar kind of effect but yeah if you're in australia you expect australian cricket and that's not just what you expect it should be what you want like those should be what you're there to overcome and if you don't get that you're going to feel like you maybe you know it's going to feel like playing a playing against a b team or something like that if you're not getting the full australian effect like that's the whole that's the whole magic of it i'm um, speaking of 
Wait, 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 wait. Oh, the, yeah, no, go for it. Another thing about Australia that has just come up recently is they make a concerted effort to play the stump mic. So I like I off the top of my head I can't remember if like the stump mic is as profound in New Zealand as it is in Australia, but regardless in Australia you have the commentators saying let's just go to the stump, stump mic for a couple of deliveries. Let's just go to the stump mic for an over. Like that happened in that test and maybe the last two seasons they have played up the stump mic angle which is good insight into the cricket field but like <laughs> you can't have any thoughts or like it's just it just seems weird to talk about um, what players are saying on the field when now touring Australia also means that the stump mic is going to be turned on and it is going to be broadcast loud and clear that is another factor in touring Australia because it doesn't happen to that extent in New Zealand or other countries. So now it just seems like that's another factor in touring Australia is whatever impact that has on the Australian players on the field, I'm not sure, like they just do what they do, but there is going to be more discussion around what is said on the field because in Australia they now make a concerted effort to play up the whole stump mic shtick. Good or bad, that's just how it is. I I quite like that little gimmick for a little bit. I mean, it, the the main point to take from that is that the Aussie guys know that the stump mics are on and are on loudly and clearly, and that what they say is going to be heard. Which is why, like, I was, you know, when they went to it, if, uh, the first time I saw them do that, it was just like, we're going to just take an over off and we're going to listen to the stump mics here. I thought, oh, that's a cool little gimmick. I wish this was a permanent thing. I could just turn the commentary off sometimes, watch another cricket, you know, um, and I could just, you know, Craig McMillan's in the box. Right, let's just listen to the, the stump mic for, for, you know, the next half hour or something like that. Um, but, like, the first thing I thought when they did that was like, well, isn't there just going to be a whole bunch of like swearing and angry shouting and stuff like this, which can't be broadcast? And then I thought, well, I guess they know that the stump mic's on, so guys aren't going to go over the top or anything like that. And yeah, they they know exactly what's going on. Um, wait, 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 again, just another ad that and that plays into their whole new because Tim Payne, he's going viral and saying like funny, witty things yep. as opposed to just the barrage of your fucking shit and stuff like that. So. Yeah, like, like when I, he asked for sharp punt to babysit for him last year. Yeah, exactly. So there's a, and that goes throughout their whole team. I think that's their, um, like Matt Wade is having interesting discussions around the batsman as opposed to directly sledging the batsman in an aggressive way. So that's it's it's different to how the old school Australians used to operate and obviously that has had to come with the situation with Australian cricket and the the sandpaper situation they had to make some changes um, but yeah so for anyone in New Zealand who's like kicking up a fuss about what Australians are saying well the stump mics are turned on loud and clear and it's they make a point of doing that so don't worry about too much of it now what do you what do you uh, got up next well i was going to throw it back to you on a very similar uh, lead-in note about the broadcasting in particular because this was sort of our first um i mean we've had we've got the aussie fox sports stuff coverage we've had it for a while you know had a couple of series but this is the first time new zealand's been involved in it so probably the first time a lot of people well, certainly the first time i've sat there and just watched extended uh you know Kerry o'keefe yarns and stuff like that since he was on the radio and like um, how do you how do you enjoy the um, the coverage? Because it is a new, it's another one of those sort of new branding things. That, um, they've taken the the bulk of the Aussie cricket stuff off of Channel Nine, um, bought them out there with the rights. Like, how how did you enjoy that whole uh, that whole fresh situation there with the coverage there? I think it's played out pretty good for Australian cricket. How the sandpaper situation roughly coincided with the change in broadcasting hmm. so all the like a old school was, eh? yeah it was like a complete rebranding not just of the australian cricket team but of how australian cricket is packaged for um 
people's consumption. So I think that's an interesting note um, just to make for starters. Oh, it's fine. Like, it's all good. There's some very smart people involved. Like, you look at the <laughs> the caliber of cricketers. One of the weirdest things is that it's always former athletes and there's less. It's about athletes learning how to be broadcasters as opposed to getting broadcasters in who are specialist broadcasters. I'm pretty sure that uh, Mark Howard who we've talked about previously as just being a fair, like I've got a bit of respect and I enjoy Mark Howard, who is like the lead um, figure on the broadcast. He is a broadcaster. He's been to Olympics. He's been to, he's broadcasted all different sports. He was the big bash commentator for a long time. He is a broadcaster who has broadcasting skills, whereas the general trend, like especially in New Zealand, is you get cricketers and then you teach them how to be broadcasters, which is, um, just weird like it's just weird but when you've got michael hussey adam gilchrist um mark war i like mark waller he's pretty good like when you've got those people talking about cricket you know you can't really go wrong other than they act like australians as well when talking about kiwis so the whole australia versus new zealand big brother little brother you know bully victim kind of idea was prevalent throughout the whole not just on the field but just throughout the whole test match experience which was amplified by having those <laughs> those cricketers there um mike hussey's analysis was like i think they overdo the analysis so like, we don't need to see <laughs> like just replays of how this bowler this batsman got out like that's no different from what the commentators are talking about so that's just a bit weird but um, in terms of like, obviously you'd expect it to be a bit better well done than old Mike, Mike Hesson's analysis thing. I don't know, like it was it was fine, it was good. Like, thing about cricket is you can check the TV on mute. You don't even have to listen to commentary. You can listen to a podcast. You can listen to music. So that was part of my experience as well. Like, there's nothing, nothing better than just having some test match cricket on in the background while you've got some beautiful background music. Well, you can't have both things in the background, but mixing <laughs> yeah, right. test cricket with music like is pretty damn Sound good. I enjoy yeah. that. So, um, but they're just Aussies being Aussies, so like, it's not my favourite. But then again, what we have in New Zealand isn't my favourite. Yeah, nah, same. And like, I I thought they I really enjoyed it. I thought they had a good balance, and there were um like a good balance between different kinds of personalities. Like you get Kerry O'Keefe coming in and telling slightly strange, but um, usually pretty funny little anecdotes. And um, even if they're not funny, like he salvages them with his laugh, which is that big wheezy laugh that he's got. Um, <laughs> that's the fella. And like when he's able to sit there with say um, someone like an Ian Smith, who's also a good storyteller, you know, that's, that's, broadcast gold right there there are times yeah like adam gilchrist talking and late in the first innings about how this game was all over because australia had got to 400 and things like that which i'm like well i mean at least they does have a chance to be bowled out before you say that you know but again like this is part of that thing like the black caps themselves have to deal with the um the the various situations that you expect from touring australia and watching new zealand play in australia i want there to be a little bit of that adversity you know as long as they're not being assholes about it which i uh, certainly got to the point where the the previous channel nine fellas um they crossed that line <laughs> by the end of it once like once richie benno was gone they certainly had crossed that line at that point because he just had a bunch of cheerleaders who it's one thing to have guys who want australia to win because i have no problem with that i've guys in the in the sky sports um shed are cheering for new zealand to win as well that's fine that's just host broadcaster stuff it's when you just have like absolute um just like an ignorance of the opponent like there's just one team playing is where it becomes a problem and i don't think that was ever the case here um, i did get a little bit frustrated at like the fact that tom latham wasn't getting the credit for being a the world-class test opener that he is by the second innings i think when he came out and stuck around a little bit you did get to see a few of those like little stat graphics of oh he's actually got the best average of any opener over the last two years oh what do you know like that kind of thing but I suppose, like, Tom Latham also didn't, he didn't exactly, like, 
prove to anyone during this test why he should be in that situation and he hasn't done it against Australia before so I, I can understand that as well yeah that's just Australians being Australian it's like worrying about the intricacies of how Australians talk like you're going to be fucking pulling your hair out for especially in a sporting <laughs> landscape uh, what I but found you want super that, right? weird you want that to see your team touring there you want to have a little yeah, bit of yeah. that adversity yeah for sure and that you've helped me understand like what I was trying to describe at the start because at the start I think I was thinking more just like the cricket but as we've moved through this podcast I'm definitely um the whole experience of the test match had that vibe of Australian bullying us it wasn't just what was happening on the field the whole experience played into that what I did find incredibly weird wildcard was those English commentators like we talked about that um maybe a few episodes ago yeah does Michael Vaughan just live there or something yeah I think they're there they would have they have done big bash stuff before so I think they get them over for the just to have them around so that when the big bash league is on they're there and they're available as well but like yeah it's one thing to have Aussies being Aussies like I can I've just told you not to worry about like little details with what the Australians are saying and it's so that you know Aussies being Aussies just take it with a grain of salt but like when you've got like Michael Vaughan clearly making like inaccurate statements about the Black Caps and how they win against England and stuff like that it's just like oh bro give it a break you're not even meant to be there you know <laughs> but what I I I think we can title this podcast smithy because i we we, we do need to maybe talk about jeet Raval in a second and then kyle jamison but i want to spend some time talking about smithy because i just don't know how to oh, there's so many thoughts there like um how ian smith operates in an australian broadcast team is amazing when you compare it to how he operates in New Zealand, like he's kind of the dumb old guy who is endlessly bullied about being fat and despite not being fat. And he's just, he doesn't, he, I don't see him fitting in at all to that New Zealand commentary team. And to be honest, that New Zealand commentary team is like a hot potch mix and match group of fucking people who apparently are good at cricket. Um, yeah, but I you think put that's Smithy. more about the guys he's commentating with than it is about yeah. him. But yeah. And then you put him into that Australia. Like, listening to Ian Smith on that commentary team was enjoyable. It was a pleasure. Um, and I just, I found it, I like, thinking deeper about it, you're like, whoa, how do the, like, all the other commentators in New Zealand, because anytime the Black Caps go to Australia, Smithy's always there. So he is always the Kiwi commentator picked to go to Australia, probably by the Australian broadcaster. So you're looking at all these other battler Sky Sport commentators, and they're just watching Smithy go off every now and again, and they're like, what the fuck? Like, I want to get that Australian gig. But Smithy is the only person who gets called up, and um, maybe internationally, like Simon Dool does a lot of subcontinent work. He, his work is primarily done either through the Indian broadcaster or through the ICC, broadcasting kind of system they've got like international commentators guys like ian bishop um i think there's a zimbabwean dude who did a lot as well just the more generic commentary teams who go around the world and so if the black caps are playing in india it's always going to be simon dool and that's that's cool but in this in this in this bubble of the Black Caps touring Australia, having Ian Smith there and just well, I just find found it enjoyable and very interesting for like a well we 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 we're, we're making a bit of a shtick about talking about commentary and the package of Test cricket and stuff like that, and I on that level of thinking, I found it very interesting that it's always Smithy goes over. How does that? make other commentators feel how does that affect chemistry or you know just thoughts 
for the other Kiwi commentators in New Zealand, and this is coming after the whole World Cup, where Smithy was a star of the World Cup in the commentary box as well. Well, all those other commentators, if they've got their feelings hurt because Ian Smith gets to go to Australia, they just got to sit back down because there is a uh, there is a pedigree there, there is a a peck and order, and Ian Smith comes in above of pretty much all of them except maybe Simon Dool because of his ICC stuff. But like, I, <laughs> I could you like we're just talking about how good Ian Smith has been in this commentary box. Could you imagine Simon Dool in his place? Like how disastrous that would be telling everybody about everything that he knows better than them and like just being real abrasive and just Simon Dooley like there's a time and a place for that and I think he's quite good on the ICC stuff because he tones that side of him down a bit in New Zealand he tends not to but he's he's still like he's a he's a quality broadcaster he's done a lot of um radio stuff as well like he used to be on the rock morning show eh so like he knows how to speak into a microphone that's fine but it's just his personality sometimes gets in the way um I have a theory about Ian Smith which goes back several years now and is right now probably as true as it's ever been, which is that Ian Smith is like, um, uh, well, <laughs> I'm trying to think of a, a comparison, but normally it works the other way around where guys are really good at home and struggle away. So like David Warner has that about him. A lot of those English cricketers that were just over here certainly have that about them too. Like I remember Chris Wokes, he, Chris Wokes actually bowled quite well in that game that he played. But his, he had something like 75 of his 85 wickets or something like that were taken in England. Um, that kind of thing. Like, Ian Smith's the inverse of that, where he's he's a good commentator in New Zealand. Do you give him the last 10 overs because he's the best at doing that? Like, taking a game into the finish, particularly in, in ODI, if that's the case. But, like... It's not. It's nothing special. He's a bit of a like. He just sort of falls back into a routine around some of those other guys, and like they put him with Mark Richardson a lot. And Mark Richardson's always clowning around and forcing Ian Smith to be more of a clown. And it's just a different vibe. When there's that slightly more professional atmosphere of being the guy representing your country in the commentary box in an away tour, and he was fantastic at the World Cup. He's been very good in that first test. Like. That's that's the kind of situation where he thrives, where he's just got a little bit more of that. Um, well, I don't even know what you'd call it. Like it's it's just slightly out of his comfort zone, so he's a little more on the edge of his seat, and he's just like, yeah, he absolutely thrives in that situation. I reckon. And to come full circle, like maybe that's what the Black Caps need. We the Black Caps need to rise up when going away from home so well, they so, certainly do they haven't had a lot of big overseas victories over this sort of like little era of very good results being a very good test team they haven't actually done a lot away from home in that time yeah and like if we're taking the it even further ian smith steps up going to australia and has done for a long time so the Black Caps need to step up in going to Australia. Like somehow Ian Smith has found out what works for him. He's still very Kiwi in the commentary. He still conducts himself like a Kiwi. He still conducts himself with the morals and values and personality of a Kiwi. But he also hits another level in terms of like asserting himself in that commentary box. Like he's not getting yanked around by anyone. He is saying what he wants to say. And he's doing so in a room with um, some of the greatest Australian cricketers to have ever lived. And that's what I want to see the Black Caps do. I want them to see them take their like baseline, but rise to the challenge that this Australian series is offering them. Certainly. Um, I want to throw a quick shout out to Mike Hussey because I don't know if I actually mentioned him before. But he, of all of them, I think is, is the best sort of... And now, well, I mean, they call him Mr. Cricket, so he should be the best analyst. I'm just talking like live on the mic in front of the thing. But then you also give him that little, um, what you were talking about before with the, um, his little, you know, Mike, Mike Hesson gets the analysis corner, right? Mike Hesson get, I mean, um, Mike Hussey gets like a, Hesson and Hussey, um, Mike Hussey gets like a full on analysis, like, warehouse you know he's got it's even sponsored by bunnings you know he's got one whole wall here with a big screen over here he walks out and there's a glass um window looking out onto the field and here he is with like a um hologram thing like 
digital the cgi felt like batsman in front of him so he can stand in the middle of his analysis and all this whereas mike hessen like the first time they did that one you could like they didn't even have the they didn't put the analysis little um screensaver up on the computer there and you could literally see the reflection of the tiny little like closet that chucked him in to do his little thing it was the funny uh funny contrast between the two of those i suppose representative also of the um differences in uh funding between between the various ones um moving on though what what i mean just throw it out there without really everyone knows the context but what would you do with jeet reval at this point well there's been talk that tom blunder will come in which just seems the most ridiculous shit i've ever heard agreed and, and like, i also think moving bj walling to open when he is the best one of the best number sixes in the world right now is also a stupid thing to do you weaken the top order by risking a new guy up there and you weaken the middle order more than anything by taking your best guy in that position out of there I would be more in favour of moving BJ Watling to open and then bringing Tom Blundell in. Well, yeah, um, I think that's better than Blundell opening, but yes. Yeah, for sure. But there's so many people like around talking about Blundell coming in that you wonder, like, are these people just like making this shit up, or uh, like, is this some inside word? Um, I also think Jeet Raval is an easy target. Like, the Black Caps have lost the test and it's jeet Raval's fault kind of thing you know like you mentioned like i like sure jeet Raval definitely needs to score runs as you said earlier coming in first second third fourth fifth over losing an early wicket is not what you want in this situation in no way shape or form is that acceptable but the, the first thing here is that the black caps put themselves in this position jeet Raval's form slump isn't new it was there before the England Test Series. Jeet Raval was out of form before the England Test Series, and not just in the Black Caps Test Team. Jeet Raval's form slump like started out, and like everyone's talking about his last 14 innings for the Black Caps. Jeet Raval went to the Plunkett Shield, and I specifically remember writing this, did nothing in the Plunkett Shield. Now, G previously, Jeet Raval's done nothing in the Plunkett Shield, and then stepped up to perform for the Black Caps. That has happened um, 2017, I think it was. So it's not a like a something that is definite, but Jeet Raval wasn't scoring runs in the Plunkett Shield prior to the series against England on top of his form slump in the Black Caps, which has gone back um, about a year in test cricket before the england series the black caps knew that they named a squad for the england and australian series and didn't include any specific batting cover they included tom blundell as wicketkeeper batsman backup and then i imagine they did so with the possibility that they could tinker with the batting lineup if Jeet Rafael's form uh, continued to struggle. Well, now we're in the situation where there is no backup batsman. There is a guy who is the backup wicketkeeper who, yeah, sure, you can wiggle things around. That is in no way, shape, or form equal, let alone better than carrying one batsman in your squad whose sole specific job is to bat and open the innings in test cricket if you have to now there aren't exactly a, an abundance of opening batsmen in the plunkett shield commanding selection for sure i don't know who you would put at the top of the order like off the top of my head right now but had you selected someone they would be in the squad they would be there. And then, understanding what we know about Giravar's form slump, if he continues to fail, you have a second tier option. You have a worst case scenario. Not even worst case, because the worst case would be bringing Tom Blundell into the team, either to open or rejig the batting lineup. The second option is you just bring in the batsman to replace Jeet Raval. The first option is Jeet Raval scores some runs and there's no issues. So this is a problem created 
by the black caps which i find absolutely ridiculous and i agree entirely like the first problem was picking a squad for five test matches which like I mean, they've already had to call up two other players along those in the first three of those test matches they've already had to call up two extra players from outside that squad as injury cover so why they would just think that the same squad to tour the, to play the two england games is the same squad that should play against australia even if you end up picking the same guys for that aussie tour at least just wait till after the england tour in case you need to reassess something knowing that and jeet raval wasn't the only one mitch Sander was coming in under a bit of pressure himself, he scored a beautiful 100 against England, probably took that pressure off himself, also a lovely 3 for in that test victory, so he probably would have held a spot, but going into that series, he didn't know that, you know, there was controversy over the spinners, like, that was the first problem, was picking, and it, well, to be it's the first problem, and everything stems from that as well, because they back themselves into a corner where they don't have a backup batsman. Um, so you would just leave Raval in for the second test, which is sort of what I think is the best, the best of a bunch of bad options, to be honest, but it's, it's still the best of them, I think, is just leaving Raval to play out the series and hope he figures it out, figures it out, would you concur with that? A hundred percent, like, it goes, it goes both ways, so to get into the Black Caps test team, you gotta fucking do some work. You gotta, you gotta be battling away on the domestic circuit for a long time, or a decent amount of time, and in that time, you got to score runs and take wickets over a period of time. To work your way out of the Black Caps test team, you need to be given like every opportunity. Like uh, this is specifically with a test team because white ball cricket, there's some weird bullshit selections that make no sense. But with the test team, everything's set up so that players are given ample opportunities at the test level. Now, all you got to do is let G. Raval play this test. G. Raval is going to be feeling the pump because if he doesn't score runs in this test, most likely the Black Caps have lost that test series over. Then you can take the piss and bring in Tom Blundell for the last test with nothing on the line because it's the first well, championship two championship points, though. Still championship points. Isn't it two tests? Like, only two tests? No, it's they they split the it's it's based on if there's two tests. So there's 120 points for each series. So if there's two tests, you get 60 points for winning a test. So if you win both tests, you get 60 plus 60. If there's three tests, then it's 40 per win. So Australia just right, got 40 right, yeah, points yeah. for winning that. So yeah, there would still Which, be 40 points on the line in the third test, even if we lost the first two. Yes, but that doesn't matter. Like if Jet Revolve fails again, then we assess that and do what's best for the team and what's best for the team in that scenario that this black caps group has created the best option would be to bring in tom blundell for the last test like that in in the in the con in the confines of this situation that is the the best option for the third test if jet raval fails twice again but for the second test on what should be a better batting pitch like those are tough conditions like Holy shit, did anyone else from the Black Caps score runs? Apart from Ross Taylor? Ross Taylor no. scored 80 in the first innings. BJ Wally yeah. scored 40 in the second innings. Those are the only two scores of 40 plus. So it feels like a lot of people are using Jeet Raval as a scapegoat because it, everything conveniently aligns. It's not like Jeet Raval was the man responsible at the top of the order for the Black Caps losing this test. G. Raval is definitely struggling. G. Raval is definitely in a form slump. As we know about Test cricket, form comes and goes. So G. Raval might come into form over the next few tests, and that's all good. That's the ebbs and flows of Test cricket. But it definitely feels like G. Raval is being um, highlighted as a major area of weakness of this Black Caps team. When I look at a Black Caps team that underperformed as a collective and like by by this assessment wildcard i know you love some mitchell santner bowling <laughs> let me just put up some i don't Mitchell's. dislike it but let me like also factor in what i've said in defending uh, mitchell santner i guess as well he's got an important role to play in terms of balance and um fit in this black caps bowling attack which i might add 
Mitchell Santner fits into this Black Caps bowling attack when the bowling attack is Tim Southey, Neil Wagner and Trent Bolt. I'm far less confident about the fit of Mitchell Santner and the Black Caps team when he is not playing alongside those three seamers. And Colin de Granholm, perhaps. That is a and very especially important... when Lockie Ferguson isn't able to bowl as well, which meant that the like in in this is a big like point in fairness to Mitchell Santner from that test was that he was not bowling in the role he was picked to bowl in because he was asked to bowl a lot more overs than expected in that first innings because he had to carry an end because the seamers we basically had two frontline seamers plus Colin de Gronholm who obviously had to have a rest at some point so Santner got through 33 overs I think in the first innings even even with Lockie Ferguson in the in the full attack though I'm far less confident about Mitchell Santner's fit like Mitchell Santner works well with a world-class seam attack that the Black Caps have at full strength I'm less confident about Mitchell Santner working well if any one of those bowlers isn't there so Mitchell Santner was to be expected to be honest and you've just reinforced that but Mitchell Santner isn't exactly guzzling down wickets he's in this team um, because of that fit and he's also coming off a century but in terms of spin bowling Mitchell Santner when he takes wickets the Black Caps kind of tend to win but he just in terms of wickets and runs and comparing Raval to Mitchell Santner there's very little to suggest that Mitchell Santner should be in the team as a test match spinner, as you have told me many times. But Mitchell Santner's never made the scapegoat. When the Black, if the Black Caps lose a test, which they haven't done a whole lot recently, so this is a convoluted argument, but it's not like, oh, Mitchell Santner, can you take some wickets, bro? you got to go. But the Black Caps have lost a test, and sure, winning tests kind of covers over bad form and that's fine because when you're winning tests you're giving um, the players in the team the opportunity to work through bad form good form but when you're losing everyone seems to jump on the one or two players who are out of form as being the reason why a team is losing when from a general wider perspective this black caps group underperformed in this test and so yeah, Jet Raval, you know, second test. The Black Caps have also formed, put themselves in this position. So it's a whole fucking mess, to be honest. I'm trying to explain it, and I'm losing my mind just trying to explain it. Simply put, I think Jet Raval is not unfairly, because he needs to score runs for sure, but the collective problem is bigger than the problem of Jet Raval, because... I mean, it's not like Tom Latham scored a shitload of runs in this test. It's not like Cam Williamson scored a shitload of runs in this test. All these batsmen struggled, let alone Jeet Raval trying to find form in a day-night test on a pitch that has cracks and is going everywhere. What do you expect Jeet Raval to do? <laughs> well, there's a trend in American sports, which is something that really annoys me a lot, and it's, it definitely plays into the way you expect Americans to talk about things, you know, with the old... The overhyped impact of things and then falling for that old like manufacturing hype and then falling for the manufactured hype which is like this happens in the nfl all the time um, I, can, I can think of an example of um carson wentz the philadelphia eagles quarterback this season who was you know an mvp candidate a couple years ago and has had a couple injuries since he's he's nothing superstar special but he's a bit above average quarterback and all his wide receivers are injured right now so all his wide receivers are injured, his stats look crap, the team loses because no one can catch a ball that he throws. Then you hear stories about how, like, Carson Wentz is underperforming. Look at his completion percentage. It's way down. He's not getting the passing yards. He's not throwing touchdowns. It's like, well, no one's catching them. Three weeks later of them losing for the same thing, you're still you're hearing, like, the, the, the struggles of Carson Wentz being exacerbated even more. It's like, he's still struggling. It's getting worse and worse and worse and worse. What's going on? Do they need to drop this guy? And I'm just sitting back thinking, well, he had a valid excuse the first time. We knew exactly what the problem was, and it wasn't him. 
three more weeks of exactly the same evidence and you're coming up with a different conclusion just because it's been hammered home over and over and over as if it's worse than like getting worse and worse as opposed to just being the same thing that's how i feel about jeet Raval here in this test this was just a ruthless situation for anyone to bat and no one scored any runs jeet Raval is being scapegoated as you say but Jeet Raval is just doing what he was doing against England and Sri Lanka before this. You know, he wasn't scoring runs prior. He He's just continuing on the same trajectory. He's not getting worse. This isn't becoming more of an issue for the Black Caps. It's just highlighted because of the because of this game situation. But we can't, like, you know, it's it's he's just doing what he was already doing. It's nothing over the top or, um, you know, crazy. It's nothing above and beyond what we'd already seen from him. So getting the extra... Um, I, it comes just with the loss, I think. It's just because we lost, people react in a different way to if we're winning and he's struggling. But yeah, it's it does seem out of proportion compared to everything else because it's not like the people who are saying Raval should be dropped now, uh, like, are they the people who thought Jeet Raval was going to score runs in this test? I don't really think anyone did. I think we knew he was struggling, which is a Black Caps problem because they went to, into a new test series with the same squad without addressing the concerns that people already had. Like, that's that's fully on the Black Caps selectors at this point. That's nothing to do with Jeet Raval. For sure. And just quickly, Kyle Jamison has been called into the squad. I heard he's really tall. <sighs> he's quite tall, but he also bowls quite well. Um averages 27 in first class cricket and roughly given 0.24 tenths or whatever it's fucking called hundreds whatever but he averages under 30 roughly in all three formats he's a good bowler he's tall but the thing with Kyle Jamison that I will say for anyone wondering it's all good to be tall but Kyle Jamison is very skillful bowls outswing can move the ball back into the right hander as well um, again, people are saying uh, Kyle Jamison should be good in Australia because he's tall. I don't know how fast Kyle Jamison bowls. He's probably, I'd say, I'd hazard a guess, he's probably 130 to 135. I think he can touch 140 on a, on a quick day. I would say yeah, 135 well, to 40 if he's steaming in. In Australian conditions in the heat, maybe you want to take 5Ks off. We saw Tim Southey bowling like 122 a lot of the time there, so like sure he's tall but it's it's still a very kiwi bowler um so i don't i'm just saying that because i don't think it's automatically automatic that he's going to be successful in test cricket in australia if he does get those opportunities um over the coming weeks but he is very skillful has unique angles which is where the height comes from but the thing about kyle jamison is he can move the ball and like i'm making this point loud and clear because people are talking about Lockie Ferguson he bowls fast people are talking about Kyle Jamison he's tall the most important thing in test cricket for a bowler is what you do with the ball can you move the ball Neil Wagner can move the ball we saw it in that day night test he swings the ball he can bowl swing he can move the ball both ways given the right conditions that's why he's a test cricketer Tim Salvey Trent Bolt they swing the ball Colin de Gronholm isn't in this team just because he's accurate. He's in this team because he's unique in the sense that he is a seam bowler who nibbles the ball everywhere. The most important thing for a test cricket bowler is your skill, is what you can do with the ball. Can you move the ball? So stop talking about how fast they're bowling, how big they are, what, all this stuff, left hand, is he right hand, whatever it is, can you move the ball? That is what uh, Test Cricket requires, that's what the Black Caps require, and that's the reason Lockie Ferguson called up, got caught up to the Test team, because he moves the ball. He bowls fast, but he also moves the ball, and he moves the ball in an unconventional way. He's not as tall as Joffre Archer, so he's different as Joffre Archer, but he moves the ball into the right-handers away from the left-handers that's his natural swing he moves the ball and he also bowls fast so just had to get that yeah i really like this selection i i don't think he's going to play i i mean obviously Trent bolt coming back in is going to take that last position and even if there was an injury matt henry is still in the squad the same situation like same conversation we had during the during the england series like matt henry is still a factor um i will 
Matt Henry on flat Australian pitches, though. I'm not sure. <laughs> I think I might I might still lean towards Kyle Jemison if that's the situation. But I don't think he will play. But I think just the experience, first time in the um, test group like that, I don't know. He, has he played a 2020 yet? I, I can't remember. He might have been in a... He's definitely played New Zealand A stuff because I watched him play a New Zealand A thing not long ago. Um, I just think it's a lovely little progressive type selection to where, and he's he's a younger guy than normally gets in, than normally breaks into this test team as well. I saw a stat, can't credit anyone because I can't remember where I saw it, but we have like generally one of the I think the oldest average um, apart from Ireland who are new to test cricket, um, we have the oldest average test debutant in terms of yeah in terms of age so generally like you look at this team right now i don't think there's anyone under the age of 27 um which is pretty consistent in most formats the world cup squad we had a bunch of guys aged between sort of 28 32 for the most part like that's just kind of the age you got to be to break into this black caps team and that's because we don't you know it's just one of those factors we don't play a lot of games fewer opportunities less rotation that kind of thing and also we just have a good generation of great cricketers where we have those three seam bowlers leading the way we have taylor and williamson and and chuck latham in the mix as well there henry nichols coming through um bj watling you know we just got a good core of players so that's just kind of the way it goes but i think jemison is a guy certainly who over the next decade is going to get plenty of opportunities to play international cricket in all three formats as well and i i really like this this the experience of bringing him in even if he's just going to be a net bowler for the next two or three weeks i think it's uh i, I think it's a really good selection yeah the type of move that um i was have been consistently critical of the black caps is not getting players like this in and around the group um, to ease them into test cricket. But as like a mic drop moment to wrap this episode up, well, Kai, what about Matt Henry? People just forget yeah. Matt Henry exists. Like it, happened, it happened for the first test England. Lockie Ferguson gets the call up. Matt Henry might not as well exist. And here, Kyle Jamison gets the call up and, no, and everyone's just assuming that unless Trent Bolt plays, that Kyle Jamison will play. Like... Matt Henry still exists. Matt Henry is still a human being part of the Black Caps squad at this moment, I guess. At this current point in time, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he's one of those guys whose position might be in a bit of threat if Ferguson and Jamison and guys like that are, are getting like brought into the extended squad, then suddenly, you know, you can't pick everyone in every squad. So Matt Henry's got a bit more competition than he's had in recent times for that sort of next cab off the rank seamer. But... For now, yes, he is in that squad. He is doing a lot of fielding. He did an extreme amount of fielding during that during that last test because of the injuries and whatnot. He's still there. He's still he's still chugging away, getting his overs in in the nets, and he hasn't. He's not dead yet. He isn't dead yet, and neither are we. We're still alive and kicking. And if you enjoyed listening to this episode of the Niche Case, jump on Patreon. Um, that's the best way to support us straight up the guts hard and fast otherwise just thank you for listening and thank you for supporting the niche case and everything that we do kia kaha stay beautiful cheer cheer